Hi everyone and welcome to ODTUG's online education series. Today's webinar is Apex World on Air, Recognizing and Preventing Security Threats in Apex Applications. This is part two of a two-part series. Presented by Dan McGann, Joel Coleman, Jurgen Schuster, Martin D'Souza, and Scott Spendolini, along with Nathan Catlow and Tim Oswick as special guests. This presentation will be recorded and available to ODTUG members on the ODTUG website tomorrow. Please Feel free to put your questions in the questions box at any time during the presentation and they'll be addressed during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar. So welcome gentlemen and thank you all for being here today. Hi guys, welcome to our second episode. And when I see the video, and now I have some figures what we really have achieved in the last two years, um, it's quite a lot. So it seems not like a community who wants to be cool. It seems like a community who is really cool and uh, produce a lot of stuff uh, just the last two years. And we even have a new conference, right? Um, Apex, RP, Adria. Uh, three different countries. It's just it's one day and 16 presentations, two different tracks. It's just for 30 bucks the day, right? It's really I'm really happy that there are still new conferences coming up. So a lot of things are going on. Um, another thing I want to come across with is please use Apex World. Not that I <laughs> that we gain anything from it, so we don't get any click counts or something, but. I really find it helpful uh, whenever I have a question, I surprise myself and I think, okay, let's try, maybe I find it in Apex World, use a, a tag that's, that's interesting. To, for the other day, I was looking for how to do a, a trigger in Apex uh, professionally and I just used the, the, the tag trigger and come out and, and um, a blog post from Sven Weller came up. It was great. So. You can use the text, you can search for, for people, and there's a lot of content now, over a thousand news uh, over the last two years. So it's pretty likely that, that you find the right blog post to your problem. Um, of course, the uh, on air show is recorded, and you will find it on our YouTube channel. And today we have a security part two. The rough agenda will be. At least, actually, it's the exact agenda, hopefully. Um, first, Dan is showing some the Apex Advisor, what uh, security things we have in the Apex Advisor. Then Scott is showing Apex Cert. Then Nathan is showing Apex Sec. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session. So we will we save a lot of time for the Q&A. So please um, write the questions in the panel. But we want to postpone the answering to the end. Now let me change. Oh, there are a lot of people. Dan, here we go. I hand over to Dan. All right, I'll go ahead and uh, share my browser screen. I'll make it nice and big because I got yelled at last time. <laughs> Okay, so what I did is imported the unsecure version of the application that I demoed in the previous webinar. And so we'll go in here, and what I'm going to show you is a tool called the Apex Advisor. And Joel, correct me if I'm wrong about the history here, but this was initially a standalone application built by Patrick Wolf, and it was called Apex Essentials at the time. And uh, you would install the app, and you would run it, and it would scan the metadata of your other Apex applications and flag different kinds of warnings or issues you may have in them. Apex team liked it so much, they were like, boom, you're hired. And we'll go ahead and integrate that right into Apex. So you can find that now under Utilities when you go into an application. And by the way, you should be running this. Before you deploy an application, every time you go to deploy an application, frankly, you should be doing this daily because you don't want to wait to the end and then find you have hundreds of issues you got to sift through. Um, but certainly before you deploy, preferably uh, on a daily basis. So you just come into the advisor here. 
And then what I'm going to have to share my whole screen in case you're getting a little pop up there. So we're just focusing on, uh, on this portion here. So you get a little pop up and you can specify certain pages if you want to search certain pages. I will perform, trying not to show the screens behind me. All right, I will just scan the entire application. So when you hit go, it's doing that metadata check. So it's going through essentially the various metadata about your applications, the pages, regions, buttons, items, and so on. And when it finishes, eventually, goodness, I should have given my VM some more RAM. No, it really scans a lot of stuff. So. Yeah. Good. All right, cool. So you'll end up doing something like this. And my general workflow is to start with errors. Errors are usually the most serious issues. So you can uncheck the other items, hit apply filter, and kind of scan through here. And, and Joel, I don't know if you've seen these. These are like false errors that uh, seem to come from universal theme. Hopefully those will eventually get removed from this report. Um, so th th those are no big deal. Um, the next thing you might look at is, uh, actually this is the last thing I concern myself with, are quality assurance issues. Uh, you can see they're only uh, flagging report. doesn't have default orders, so no big deal. We won't concern ourselves with that. But we'll focus instead on security and hit apply filter. The majority of these, as you can see, are authorization issues. There's a total of four, and if I uncheck uh, inappropriate use, you'll see that basically it's flagging um, pages that don't have an authorization scheme applied to them, which if my application is using an authorization scheme, this isn't really a big concern for me. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that, so I'll uncheck that. And that leaves us really with just one thing, which is inappropriate use of substitution syntax. And this is, in fact, uh, a good catch. So possible SQL injection detected gives you the item name and, and you know what the problem is. And of course, as we saw from the previous demo, this is like a big no-no using this particular substitution variable syntax in PL-SQL or SQL code. Um, so it's a good catch, uh, but it did not catch some of the other issues that we had on, on other pages. This is just um, the first SQL injection demo, so it didn't flag anything for demos two or three, or the session state protection uh, issues that we saw before as well. Having said that, I don't want to diminish the value of this tool at all. It is incredibly powerful, and it's definitely something you should be using on a regular basis. It'll often find uh, things, for example, you delete an item or change an item name, but you forget all the various references to that item throughout your application. Essentially you then have a bug and this will of course help you find and fix those bugs. So uh, in terms of security, maybe you're not going to catch everything, it'll catch a little bit, um, but make sure you're using it on a regular basis regardless. So it's, it's, more, it's more like a health check over the all application and one part is uh, security findings, right? Exactly, I'd say that's a, a fair description. Great. Thanks, Dan. Then let's move over to Scott and see a much more focused application on security. All righty. I'm going to make myself a presenter here. And let me know if you're seeing an Apex Builder screen before I jump into this. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So, Apex Cert uh, used to be called eCert, which used to be called some Neva Cert. Um, it also used to be a four cost tool that we would sell. Um, you'd license it, you pay, you know, license and support. Once Ancatech was acquired by Accenture, the decision was made to no longer sell. Uh, you know, at the time, it was called eCert. So we went and we petitioned to Accenture to make this an open source project just because we didn't want the work that we put into it to, to literally disappear. And like, you know, mostly thanks to Doug and his uh, negotiating skills with the Accenture legal team, uh, we got that approved pretty easily. So it has been open source now for probably about two and a half years, give or take. Um, we're a little behind. Uh, the 5.1 beta version is out. There's one more report I'm working on. We used to call it the mother of all reports. Uh, once that's done, 
I'm confident that what we've got out there for 5.1 is ready for production. Uh, hopefully in the next week or so, and I know I've said that before, but this time it, it's really pretty much done. Um, I'm just polishing up the last report and removing all the um, old PL PDF calls to the new PL FPDF uh, open source PDF generator we use. But anyway, um, so Apex Cert installs one time into your database. It's much like Apex. Um, it's a shared schema. It uses a part size schema that interacts with the, the core database objects, packages, procedures. Once it's installed, um, you'll get a little link over here uh, that says launch Apex Cert. And when you click on that, you're automatically authenticated based on the user that you've signed into. So I'm in a workspace called Eco and a user called Admin. Um, I can automatically see the console here. Depending on how you want to configure it, you could be typically limited to your own workspace, right? So if I go to this tab here and I launch Apex Cert, um, this is a far less privileged user. I could only see the Eco workspace Whereas if I go to this user over here, I can actually see any workspace um, that I've defined access to or granted access to. So I could be an evaluator that evaluates across any workspace, any app, or just the default behavior, I could evaluate my own applications. So in this case, I've got a version of the sample database application we're gonna evaluate. Um, full disclosure, I did have to go in and break a few things in order for the, uh, the security alerts to come up in Apex Cert. Um, but there are some things that I didn't break, and just by default, uh, some of the options in the sample database app probably could be tightened up a little bit. So what CERT will do and what it's doing right now is processing all the metadata, um, depending on the big, how big your server is. Sometimes this takes 10, 20 seconds. Uh, for larger applications, it might take a couple minutes. It'll then put any exception back in place uh, that was uh, logged previously, and it'll produce a dashboard. So it's an Apex application. All the things you know and love about Apex are, are included with it. The goal, again, when we built this tool is to get you to what's wrong as soon as we possibly can and then get back to work. So what we've done is also created this three-tier scoring system. The raw score that CERT's going to report is based on the rule set. The only way for that raw score to go up is for you to actually go do stuff that's going to make the rule set come back with more positives than negatives. If you get a 100% raw score, your app is going to be guaranteed 100% secure because it won't run. Um, so you don't want to get raw to 100%, but rather what you want to do is get pending and approved to 100%. So what we do with pending is we allow you to identify and put an exception in place for what we call a false positive. Think about the login page. It is a public page by default. If the rule says all pages must require authentication, well, you'll never be able to log in, and hence, again, you'll, your application will be perfectly secure. So what we let you do is put these exceptions where you see fit to increase your pending and your approved score. Approved is simply another user coming in behind you and saying, yes, we agree that that's a legitimate exception that you've put in place. You're right, page 101 shouldn't be a required to be authenticated page. It's perfectly fine as public. Keep in mind that administrators should be a different person and should also know about Apex so that they can understand what the exceptions that you've put in place really mean. They could also reject them and say, well, you've, this one I don't agree with. This item should be encrypted, and here's a justification why. So let's go through a couple little things here. You can see we ran the report on the sample database app. Um, you're always going to see high levels of item encryption defects because we pretty much say every item needs to be encrypted. That's not necessarily true. And in a lot of cases, what you really want to do is identify those that should and enable it and then leave the ones that shouldn't uh, to be unencrypted. What I mean by encrypted is how Apex stores that item in session state, um, which a DBA, even an Apex administrator, could see that data if it's not being encrypted in session state. Um, we also identify over here by uh, category and classification the different failures that have occurred. Um, and this is normal. Page and report tend to be high. URL access, uh, URL tampering rather tends to be high. Settings are low. SQL injection, again, as we talked about last week, it's rare you're going to find any in Apex, um, but they're there. They do exist. And then cross-site scripting. So as a developer, you could come in here and you can see, you know, how it's impacting what how the classifications break down, what it impacts, the severity of each one of the issues, 
or you could jump over and click on any one of the charts and go and say, I want to work on rejoin sessions, or maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to go to settings and I work on, want to work on security first, or you can simply just use the tabs to navigate through the application. Um, I find it more useful to basically use the targeted approach because if there's no SQL injection, I'm certainly not going to go through every tab here. And again, that's how we designed the tool to guide you to where the issues are. So let's start with settings here. I'm just going to click on settings. I know there's a few that uh, have issues. And again, it's a very simple red, yellow, green light type metaphor that we use. If it's 100%, then there's really no reason to drill into these categories because everything has been taken care of either by making it more secure or by having an exception approved. Pending means that, or the yellow means that we're not quite there. We have a few that fail, um, where red means, yeah, this one's pretty bad. You could also set the tolerances that you want, right? So you could say that anything less than 100 fails. Um, I think right now by default, we say anything less than 70, between 70 to 100 will render as yellow, 100 is green, anything below that is zero. So let's start with the security where we got 11 out of 15 points. You can see that the report will run and it'll basically show you all the settings it's looking at, the value it found, what Apex Cert recommends, and whether or not it passed or failed. So authorization scheme, we can see that it's not set to anything. The recommendation is that it should be set to something, typically a gatekeeper scheme that makes your users have access to the app. If we're not sure what authorization scheme is, you can click on the info link and it'll give you our interpretation of the authorization scheme in this context. If that's not enough, you could always punch out to the Oracle help where we've directly linked into the online docs that talk about the same attribute. But even more useful, if you wanna fix this, if you click on the wrench, it's gonna give you the step-by-step -step instructions as to what to do to get this attribute to pass. So we're gonna go here, click this, do that, whatever the steps are. Even easier, if you're um, evaluating an application and you're also authenticated to that workspace, you'll be able to click on the edit link and it'll drop you right into the page where that attribute can be fixed. So in this case, I'm just gonna say must not be public user. I'm gonna save my changes in Apex. And then if I rerun just the page score here, Watch as fail turns to pass uh, because I cleared out that, ex that failure by actually making this adhere to the rule. Now, if we scroll down, you're gonna see things like runtime API usage, rejoin sessions. All these could be fixed in a similar fashion. You could even put comments in place or notations. Do we need this to be on, right? So just notes that other developers will see in the application later on. You can see that that changes to a little double bubble with one comment. Let's go to another part of security. Um, and what I wanna show next is the application settings. So build status is run and develop and status is available with edit links. Well, for development, there's really not a lot of other choices here. For production though, we may wanna change these, but for now, in order to get this point back, in order to get this to pass, we can create what's called an exception. And the exception requires a simple justification, okay for development. And we'll go ahead and create that exception. And you'll notice it's now pending. And you don't see the precision here, but the pending score increased just ever so slightly. Um, and this attribute now is in that pending state until another user either approves or declines that uh, exception. So we could do another one here for status and also do okay for dev, create that exception, and maybe we'll see it go up. No, not quite yet. So this is how the whole tool works. Um, once you're familiar with the process of seeing what's wrong, either going and fixing it, which is preferred, or putting exceptions in place, um, which is okay in many cases, you would simply go from tab to tab. Um, in this case here, things like deep linking, duplicate submissions, it looks like these are off at an application level, so we could probably fix those pretty easily. Uh, but page authorization and form autocomplete don't do as well, and they do require a little bit more work, right? So form autocomplete, 
Typically, it's enabled, and it should be off. Otherwise, your browser is going to potentially store sensitive data. So what we can do in this case, let's say we want our requirement to have this on. The users want it. There's no sensitive data. I can submit an exception for all the failures. What that'll do is basically make it a lot easier for me to go through 60 different pages and do the same thing. So I can go in and maybe lock down two or three and then submit the exception for the rest. And again, I get my points back. You can see now our pending score is definitely increasing. And I would simply jump back up to page and report. And now that the form autocomplete is 100%, I would simply go to the next one or the next one. And again, the tool works the same regardless of where you are in the tool. SQL injection, um, again, this is one that I had to make it fail uh, because it came back as 100%. But again, it's an interactive report, so we can just filter out for the failures. And even more so, if I click on the link, it'll show in the code where it found the issue. And I could go in and make a change to that to make it more secure, or potentially, maybe that's okay, right? In this case, that's coming from a numeric column and I'm 100% confident it can never be compromised. I can put an exception in place. We'll go ahead and create that exception. What we also track is once that exception is in place, if another user or the same user or anybody comes into this query and adds anything, even if it's harmless code, once that region has changed, the next time that cert runs, you're gonna notice that that result here, the pending exception turns to what's called stale. And the reason we do that is we can no longer guarantee that the code that was put in for the exception does the same thing anymore. It may, it may be completely harmless, um, but what we'll give you is a before and an after image of that code so you can go in and make that decision for yourself. And you can see here where the changes were made. And it's up to you now to say, all right, that really didn't hurt anything. I'm just gonna say, this is still okay. Or I could say, you know what, they actually fixed it or what they did made it better. I'm just gonna withdraw my exception altogether. So again, security isn't just a one-time thing. It's a process, it's ongoing. And just because today at 1225, your application came back with 100%, certainly doesn't mean that it's 100% forever, right? People can break stuff just as easy as they can fix stuff. Any report um, anywhere can be printed to PDF. Just click on the printer icon and it produces a pretty basic but typically good enough report. A lot of customers that we talked to with eCert needed this. It was more of a, a political requirement than something that they're gonna actually use. Um, but being able to generate these reports right from the tool without any additional software, um, it is a pretty decent uh, add-on here. One other thing, I know I've got about two or three minutes left. Um, my favorite report is probably this authorization inconsistencies. This looks at a really common mistake most developers, whether you've been using Apex for five minutes or five years, tend to make. And it comes down to when you start securing your application, typically when you do it later, you will go in and make sure that you remove tabs and, and list items and links and things like that. However, what this report is gonna look at is any, in this case, we're looking at the um, list entries that have an authorization scheme locking down that specific list entry, but the target page has no authorization scheme. So all a user would have to do is manipulate the URL and go to page 33 and be able to see this page, even though the developer went out of their way to say that you need the administration role in order to see this page. This, like I said, it's my favorite report because it catches stuff all the time. We look for a whole bunch of stuff, callbacks, processes that don't have authorization schemes that could be called through the URL, um, as well as simple navigational controls that you just may have forgot to lock down the corresponding pages. Um, real quickly, and I'm out of time here, you can schedule these to run, um, and you can have notification lists of users who aren't necessarily Apex developers, so if management wants to get a copy of the report, it can send it every day, every week, whatever uh, interval you set it to, to run at. Um, and like I said, once we've got that last report, 
which we call the, uh, the mother of all reports here, the evaluation summary report. It's a little bit busted up, but we're working on that. That's going to produce that PDF report for every single attribute. Typically, it's 120, 150 pages, uh, but a lot of people have expressed that they need that, again, part of their whole audit uh, security process. So I think that's about it time-wise. You're going to let me know how I doing. I think it might be two minutes over. Okay. Scott, let me just ask you one question. We'll come back to others later, but uh, what versions of Apex does the tool support? Um, we've got a version that runs with 4.2, 5.0, 5.1 is in its final beta stage. If you were to download it today and use it, this is the only page that I'm aware of that doesn't work. Um, once we get this running, um, we'll push it out for 5.1 production. Like I said, probably this or next week. Okay, thanks. Great, thanks, Scott Dan. Let's hand it over to Nathan. And hear it from the Apex self part. Somebody Nathan? Gave Hello? Is, yeah, you, is Scott, you, you, you need to stop sharing. Oh, I think I got Nathan, the presenter. Okay. See if this works. Okay. Yes. Brilliant. Right. Okay. Well, um, we've got a commercial product called, uh, many people would have heard it, um, uh, ApexSec. Um, and um, a little bit of history about us as a company is that we've been working very closely with the uh, UK government uh, and um, the UK Army um, in securing their Apex applications. Um, um, we've been involved in the security arena for, well, over 15 years now. Um, and we, we began to realize that um, the Apex um, kind of did um, exhibit the same sort of vulnerabilities as most other um, web application frameworks, even though it's excellent uh, at, um, at providing a, a quite a secure um, application when you accept the defaults. And it's very hard to kind of wander off the, uh, you know, off the Apex way of doing it. But we were finding that the more advanced that the applications got, um, the more security vulnerabilities crept in. And um, they were generally um, kind of within um, PLSQL blocks, um, SQL queries, um, non-escaping of uh, columns in reports, and these kind of little sort of issues creep into every um, Apex application over time. Um, so what we ended up doing is, is creating a, a, a tool, which is uh, ApexSec. Um, and um, this was designed specifically for very high security environments. So um, you're, you wouldn't be allowed to install um, an, an extra Apex application or, or on the database to uh, do the security. Um, many of the databases actually contain information which is beyond our clearance levels. Um, so, they'll, so to actually access the systems is very difficult. Um, so we needed to write a tool which were which you were able to pull the um, application and associated code which were, was at a specific um, classification level uh, that's lower than the data and able to scan it. So that's why we created this very um, simple to install um, Java application uh, which um, scans Apex applications from either directly from the builder. Um, it can connect to a database, or it can actually um, scan the export files locally. Um, so it's just a, a, a very brief overview of why we created um, um, the application in this way. Um, so um, there's no install on the server, as I just uh, said. These minimal credentials are required, so you don't need Sys or the Apex schema or anything. You just need your developer login credentials. Um, so, um, you should be able to see uh, our product in front of you, and I'm just going to create a new project, um, and I'm going to connect it to my Apex instance, fingers crossed. Um, so, there's just uh, one application on this, and this, this is our 
um, vulnerable application, which is called the Big Bad Blog. And if you've seen me talk at Kscope and, and other conferences in the UK, you'll you know, you'll have seen this um, application being uh, exploited. Um, so what it does, it just connects in through the builder, pulls the application, um, and um, runs the analysis. Uh, it's very straightforward. Um, it just basically gives you a very simple overview of the um, plugins that it's run against the application, and you get a very simple drop-down um, list at the left-hand side. So um, obviously, uh, as we've heard, you know that, um, that both the builder and Apex Cert can deal with the kind of metadata level um, problems within the within the application, and that would be things like uh, item protection, um, page protection, authorization schemes. Um, so ApexSec does um, all of those things. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly do this because we obviously I don't want to reproduce uh, what we've just seen. So when you uh, when you go into the um, oops, when you go into the uh, analysis, how do I get rid of that bar? It's annoying. Sorry. Um, you get um, a quick overview of the problem, the issues. Uh, and the recommendation. Um, so, in this particular case, there's a there's a, um, a hidden item which where the value hasn't been protected. So, if you saw Dan McGann on the last webinar, um, this is that last step um, which he was which he was talking about, um, where if you've got hidden items on the page, normally you want to protect the value of them. So, it's very simple. We can go into the builder. And the builder integration is all built into ApexSec, and you can just turn the value protected to be yes and apply the changes. And that's as, and that's as easy as it gets. Um, so um, the real power of ApexSec is its, is its code analysis. Now, it, it actually analyzes both PLSQL and SQL queries. And so when you're talking about quite um, hard to find SQL injection vulnerabilities. It does very well um, in detecting um, quite deep into the code. Um, we are trying to get uh, much deeper. We've got um, some changes in the pipeline, but um, if we if we select SQL injection vulnerabilities and go from the builder to the code, we can kind of see the level of analysis it conducts within the within the code. Now this particular now this particular region is is just a PLSQL block which outputs uh, HTML. Um, so we can kind of see very simply um, the the ApexSec has detected this um, SQL injection uh, vulnerability in this particular open cursor statement. So we can sort of, we can see. Like the uh, the P1 author um, item um, and also P1 P1 show item has been um, insecurely concatenated onto that uh, statement and and run within the within the open cursor statement. So that's how how deep it goes into the code. And the, and when you get to more complex Apex apps, you will find a lot of these. Um, uh, a lot of these kind of uh, vulnerabilities will start creeping into the code. Um, so there's a, a few examples of this. Um, this is a particular uh, application process where again um, the values coming in via the WWV flow um, item, um, the a AJAX call um, value, and it's been uh, concatenated onto the um, Onto the onto the SQL and, and, and execute immediate has been run on it, and that's a classic SQL injection vulnerability. So obviously, to fix these sort of things, we can very quickly go into the builder. I do apologise; it is a bit it is a bit small. Let me see if I can magnify it a bit. There we go. So um, so here we can edit. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just I'm going to very quickly <coughs> stick in a DBMS. I don't see any magnification, but that's all right. Oh, is it not working? It's okay. Oh. We get the idea, Nathan. It's okay. So, right. um, so I'm just going to do. Uh, 
see it. You can't just get it's all it's really zoomed in on my screen. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what I'm what I'm actually doing is just putting a DBMS uh, uh, end quote literal around that um, end value. And save it. And then what I'm going to quickly do is quickly rescan the app. And we can see that there's a little tick mark at the uh, at the side of the uh, SQ immediate, uh, and it's actually being fixed. So, um, so the power of ApexSec is not only does it does them do the metadata, it actually goes it goes it goes into the code, and it can actually tell the difference between um, the code as it stood before um, w with a, a bad concatenation, and, and it's understood that we've corrected that code with the DBMS assert end quote literal. Um, so. So some people who, who have written um, a very simple uh, Apex application perhaps might run ApexSec and it, and it may only find a few <coughs> metadata um, vulnerabilities and they might think, oh, well, it, it, it doesn't really check very much. But what's actually, uh, what, what it, the power of it, it is that um, it can actually go deep into the code. Most of our findings are actually based on real exploitable issues. So we, so we, we don't tend to report things like duplicate form submission because it's not really a, like a vulnerability in there per se. Um, and and also a few of the other things that we haven't really successfully exploited I I in the wild. Um, so um, so the, the benefit you get with something like um, Apex uh, is that it can, it's, it's a bit more ge generic in the kind of settings that, that, it, that it can detect. Um, but when it comes to doing really intensive security analysis, then uh, ApexSec is the, it, you know, it has got the power to find these vulnerabilities. Um, I mean, Joel was our biggest fan. Obviously, Oracle, um, Oracle have bought um, ApexSec to use on their internal apps. Um, we also have um, like high security clients such as government organisations uh, uh, and the army who can't actually do um, can't actually install anything extra on their high security database in, in, in stores. Um, we don't try try to make a big song and dance about the the number of vulnerabilities etc. I mean we have we do have a, um, a, a, a HTML based reporting. Um, you know, we could, we just have a very um, sort of a, a vague pass rate. We do support things like um, we do support the the indicating things as being false positive uh, that you can add. Uh, you can actually um, manually override um, AppExec, and you can um, and you can put um, some comments in. Uh, so it's very um, it's very focused towards uh, the developer, so um, so they can just very quickly work through it. It doesn't treat security as uh, as anything particularly special. Um, we we we're, um, we're fully compatible with continuous integration such as Jenkins and Hudson, uh, and so it kind of fits quite nicely in quite a few of our clients' um, build system where they pull the the source code from from Git. Um, they get Apex sectors to analyze the source code and then it plugs into the uh, continuous integration graphs uh, and, the, and, and the bugs from, a, from Apex sec just join in with all the other with all the other problems they have to fix um, so so there isn't so much so much sort of getting the, the manager involved and roles it's just basically a very simple way of um, getting your app Analyzing it and fixing the vulnerabilities. Um, so um, that is basically it for me. A very whistle stop uh, tour of ApexSec. So Nathan, one correct me if I'm wrong, but um, my understanding is that um, you also can scan stored procedures, functions, and packages. Yes. Yes. Um, so, so it'll anal so it'll analyze the application and and find out what um, functions and procedures are caught being called from other packages, and then it will go on to then analyze within those packages too. So it will pick up 
um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities from sort of functions that might return data being concatenated with HTML is a common one. Um, so it, it does go very, very deep into the application, and, and we are going to go even deeper uh, next year. Cool. Sorry, Nathan, I got a question as well. Is this just SQL and PL SQL, or does it do JavaScript uh, too? It doesn't do JavaScript um, enough to um, for me to say that it would be able to pick up vulnerabilities within JavaScript. Um, what it will do is it it does analyze JavaScript into an extent where it won't ask you to it will it will give you prompts so that when you try to protect um, items which are referenced in JavaScript, it will warn you to say that that you, that it will not it, your application won't work if you protect an item which you're trying to send in. Um, again, that's something we do want to do um, in the future, um, but um, that is kind of behind the PLSQL stuff that we're we're trying to um, increase. Um, um, we're going to concentrate on the plugin side of things first. Um, I know Martin uh, was very keen on us trying to um, scan the plugins on um, Apex World, um, but our engine just wasn't, I wasn't happy with the engine, so we're, we're in the process of writing that now. It's taken us quite a few months to, to, to get to the next level of analysis. So I'm hoping that some plugin scanning will happen next year. <laughs> Fingers crossed. That'd be good. One of the questions came in for you, and this is kind of specific, but uh, it can analyze stored procedures, but what if the stored procedures are accessed over a database link? Yes, so in that case, you will need to give it the source code, as in you pull the source from those database links and put them all into a directory and get, and get, it, and get it to analyze under the directory. It won't... Um, it won't yet um, go, um, go allow you to put the credentials in for another database. We have got a change coming which will allow you to sign into separate schemas, um, so um, so you'll be able to pull the code from, say, the shadow schema into the main schema, and it will analyze it. Um, but yeah, so there is a way of doing it. It's just not quite as user friendly, perhaps, as it should be. Okay, uh, Scott, this one uh, was asked earlier for you. So does your tool collect any client-related info from the scanned apps? Um, no, nothing gets sent back to us or anybody. It's all local. And we're just supposed to trust you? It's open source, man. You can go and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I trust I you. I don't analyze your problems. I got enough. So, no, it's, it's all... The only thing I thought of adding at some point is is a pinger to say, hey, there's a new release ready, but that's not in there right now. Oh, hey, hey Nathan, just, Nathan, just, Nathan, just so you know, we can still see your screen, mate. Yeah, I'm trying to work it out to turn it off. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions from the panel? So, I don't mean to put either Nathan or Scott on the spot, but I did email you my um, insecure app, right? So, so folks saw what um, the uh, the built-in tool can can Apex Advisor can pick up, which wasn't very much. Uh, but if either of you uh, think you can have a go at it and, and kind of show us what it picks up on that app, uh, I'd be interested to see it. So it's a very small app; shouldn't take long to scan. Uh, but hopefully it picks up more than just that one SQL injection vulnerability that the Apex Advisor picked up. Um, uh, okay, well, I'm just downloading it now. Okay. Uh, let me, so if we don't have more questions, let me tell you my personal experience. I'm doing now the security stuff with ApexSec from the Rex guys for a couple of years, I guess. Um, and what I have learned is Security is an all or nothing thing. Yeah, you cannot say, so we have a department which is really scanning our applications uh, before they go uh, on production and after big change requests and every couple of years so they get scanned, rescanned again. So you really need to know what you do. This is what I learned. It's not that you say, okay, I'm fixing some stuff. You really need to fix everything. So, um, and 
with Apex Sec. I guess Nathan, correct me if I'm wrong. You checking something like ninety vulnerability possibilities, right? Uh, yeah, we check. Some, we have about ninety-one different plugins, and they do. Um, they can do multiple checks, but uh, but roughly, yeah, yeah. ninety-one. And that, and that means and that means guys, you have no chance to get your Apex application one hundred percent secure without a tool. No chance, because even if you know everything, I guarantee you, you will forget fifty percent, and. Um, you have no chance to get really secure without a tool. No, and the cost of if of a, a vulnerability if, if if you get if your application gets hacked, it's very high. Now, not to mention the, the the image loss and everything. So, what I also learned is two simple rules: though never trust the client. So you always have to protect. We always have to think the client is lying to you, so it makes no sense to do any protections on the front end. And the other um, rule I've learned, protect the ends before the means. That means um, you have to protect the database first. The database has to be secure 100%, and then you can do additionally security checks on the front end, but first you have to check uh, the back end, right? Yeah, I, I say thing. even with a tool, you're not secure. Tools make it easier. They don't solve everything. Yes. Um, yes. So it, it's more about process. It's more about education. It's more about understanding what you're doing. And when you write code, thinking about, hey, can someone hack this code? Am I doing this right? Am I binding all my variables? Um, it, it, any tool, both tools, all three tools aren't going to solve 100% of all vulnerabilities. If you're not sure what you're doing, or you're just kind of you know slamming code in there, yeah, that's a hundred percent true, and that's a big big benefit when you're using one of these tools. You really learn the security stuff. So without having this and going through every now and then, um, this is the only way you really learn and, and put it in your daily um, in your daily um, work that you just do it right from the beginning. And I'm always I always forget to doing it. You should do it at least once a week, right? Because there's a lot of false positives, but they are, you can only identify false positives if you still know where does the item come from, comes it from the database, is any user uh, inputting some data. We don't know it after half a year uh, when you do it at the end. It costs you 10 times more effort if you do it at the end. So a great learning device. and. You should do it every week at least. And it costs you much more time in the end. Uh, so I put your app down into uh, Apex. Set. Um, now, I don't think the you, you. I don't think that that's an SQL injection vulnerability you've got in there. But um, the if you can see the code, is that the, is that the what you were referring to? And here you Dan, 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 you're oh. muted. Apologies. Oh, hey. Myself on mute. Um, no, this is a. Um, it's the. I'm looking for the one that the advisor picked up, which is uh, page one of the application. Mm. And it's the. Uh, it's a it's a dynamic action PL SQL process that ends up getting executed, which is using the substitution variable syntax. Okay. Well, for some reason, it hasn't detected that, so I'll have to. Yeah. Mind if I grab the But I did notice it picked up the hidden item, um, and I I would assume also. Um, both unprotected on submit and uh, and the other one. Um. Guys, before we try to code live, I would yeah. rather be interested in the differences between the two tools. Maybe, I don't know, Nathan or Scott, can you tell us 
because these are similar tools. Does anybody know what the differences are? I think this would be interesting for the audience too. Well, I mean, I, th I think I explained that uh, that we analyze code uh, and uh, Apex Assert analyzes metadata, and that's the basic difference. That's, that's so, not hard to say, Trine. We do the code too. We go through and we look for not not the depth that you guys do, but we look for things like execute immediate. We look for um, DBMS SQL calls, and we look for item syntax as well. We don't go outside of the Apex app yet. We're not doing the PL SQL packages, functions, procedures like you guys do. Um, but it's not fair to say we don't analyze code. Yeah. Uh, okay. But it's a it's, it's okay, quite so a simple rep type type searching. Yeah, I mean, to me, so the difference, it, it, they're two different approaches. They're similar approaches, but they're different approaches. Um, the Apex cert being an Apex app, I, I get it. You know, you're not going to get this installed in high security clearance uh, sites, right? That, that's not going to happen. But I've not run into any of that. And in fact, with a couple of my high security clearance sites, we have gotten it installed. Um, so I wouldn't let that fact turn anyone off to taking a look at it. Um, obviously, one of the differences being cost would, would make people maybe gravitate towards one versus the other. I, I would try to put that difference aside. You need a tool that's going to do what you need to do the best. One being free, one being not free, it's silly not to use both. Um, they both cover things slightly differently. One hits stuff that the other one doesn't. Um, th there's no harm in that, right? So one is out there for free, go ahead, download and use it. The other one, yeah, you go a little bit deeper in a lot of areas that, that CERT right now doesn't touch. Um, so if that cost is worth it, then yeah, go ahead and use it. Here's the thing, right? If, if cost is your problem, you're totally doing it wrong because simply say there's a security breach, now what's our budget, right? Because it, it's unlimited at that point. And, and it's a tough sell. Yeah. It's a really tough sell to be able to do that. <laughs> Um, but it's a lot cheaper to shell out a couple thousand up front than have to deal with the fallout, which could cost millions, right? I mean, you know, here, I'm sure everywhere, all the different, you know, data breaches, it's about one a week these days. Yeah. The way I would look at it, and, and, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of see uh, Apex Cert as the Apex advisor on steroids, and I see it as a, a team-focused tool uh, that you know, kind of has this uh, ability to distinguish roles and and do you know overrides and this kind of thing. Um, and then I see Apex Sec having advantages in that, as Nathan pointed out, it can integrate with build systems. Uh, so as you get into like more of a CI/CD kind of workflow, it can work at the command line and be a part of that flow, flagging any issues that arise as developers are doing their work, uh, but also. It, it has an advantage as, as Apex apps get larger and larger, you know, folks are going to tell you your, your PL SQL code is growing, pull that out of the app, move that into the database as a stored procedure, and once you've done that, you've taken it out of the metadata, and now only a tool like Apex Sec is going to pick up on those security on vulnerabilities because it's going to go into that code and find them for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, Apex Sec, you know, is it, as I say, is, it goes really deep. I mean, it. it uh, uh, you won't mind me saying this, but it found um, a serious vulnerability in in Apex uh, last year. So that's how deep it goes. I mean, it. it you know, if Apex uh, if Apex uh, could have checked itself, would it have found the same vulnerability as, as Apex Sec? Probably not. Um. I have a question for you, Scott. So earlier, what was it that you said? Um, you d you mark something as okay for development, right? Right. Like how how does that become a part of somebody's flow? If I mark something as okay for development, and later I'm going to deploy an application, how do I make sure that I fix this thing that's okay at one point in time, but not when we go to deploy it in prod? Right. Well, what you could do is you could, you could export um, your exceptions and then import those on production and rerun it. Or you could, you know, just pull those two um, out and run a different attribute set. That's probably a better way to do it. So, you know, we've got like 120 different attributes that we could evaluate. Um, you don't need to do all 120. So for dev, you might want to pull out 
run and build and availability status because they're always going to fail, right? You always have to turn those on um, to, to build an Apex app. Um, and then you just rerun it on QA with those two present and then make sure that they, they adhere to the, the actual values. Okay. I did so want to show just real quickly though, let me make myself a presenter. So here is your app, right? Your security demo app. And we did catch the SQL injection on your dynamic action over here. The one where you click the great job. Yep. And then we also caught the cross-site scripting risk on your interactive report column over here where you had that column without modification. In addition to a few other things too. So a couple of hidden items that <clears throat> were protected also popped up as well. Nice. I don't think that that cross-site scripting is exploitable because I think M no is a number. Yeah, that'd be one of the ones we'd flag as okay. I mean, uh, um, and that's the, the you know, so the, talking about the difference between Apex Tech, Apex Tech would actually, if you just sent me the, the, t the, the table definitions, it would have realized that was a number and not, and not actually highlighted it. Oh, very nice. Cool. And if you connect directly to the database, can it can it pull it in for you? Yeah. Excellent. That that's new. I hadn't seen that before. I haven't seen the the, the product for a while. That looked pretty good. Um, see, would it, you know, would it still be a problem though if it's not just a number here? I'm concatenating other stuff with it. If it's not matter. it. I, mean, I just think it, it, it I, I get what you're saying, it's a number now, but if that changed too, what if it's not a number anymore? What if someone changed the ID to a bar car? I'd still be suspicious of it, right? I'd want to go in and look. And again, this is why I said there's no one tool that's going to be, that, that should be 100% trusted, right? You should kind of know what the tool's doing and you should go, okay, I see that. You're right, it is a number. I'm going to go ahead and sign off on that. Um, so again, two slightly different approaches. Um, to the same exact vulnerability. Um, you know, you could argue one's better than the other, but I think they're, they're both just different. So, so I mean, if, you, if, if, the table if the table changed to a varchar, then Apex set would, would make that vulnerable again. So, so it, it, you know, it will, it will detect changes to the schema. Gotcha. Guys, would you agree that, sorry, Dan, go ahead. I was just, Curious about uh, Apex, uh, I'm sorry, Apex Advisor. I'm getting confused with all these names. Uh, you know, are you guys still adding new tasks and kind of expanding that feature out? Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, it's very broad. It's more than just security. So like in Apex 5.2, you're going to see some additional checks for accessibility, which is also very important. Um, but um, um, the Apex Advisor, I don't see it uh, uh, ever getting to the point that um, Apex Cert or Apex Sec is. I, I mean, if we had unlimited money and time, uh, we probably could get there, but that's just not reality. Right. Dan, can I add one thing on the Apex Sec? What, what I tend to do in a lot of applications is Apex Sec is good for this general checks that you need to do, but sometimes projects have specific checks you want to do. And so we write usually a, a query that's like a mini version of Apex Advisor. And I know there's an app for that, a, a, bill, um, what, a sample app, but we just it's want to... Standards, standards tracker. Yes, standards okay. tracker. We, 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 I didn't even want the app because I just want it as a query that we can run. So it's either a view or something so I can run it in dev and like, it's just really simple for developers. It's not a knock on the sample app. And that has proven a huge advantage for us. And as Jurgen was saying that you have to think about security from day one, if you build in, if you really think about it and you can put your checks, you can write custom checks in there as well. So it's a, it's a huge help if you look at the Apex Advisor, see how it lays things out and then try and mimic that. You're not, again, no, no check is gonna be 100% perfect, but we've knocked off a lot of problems just by making our own little mini advisor. Yeah, I mean, as Joel said, I mean, the standards tracker um, kind of covers that uh, quite well. I mean, we we will always just very much focus on the security side of things because that's kind of what we do. Um, I, there's no particular plans to to make it uh, a more generic um, standards 
type checker. Um, uh, just because we've got to remain remain focused on the security angle, really, and uh, you know, uh, and we'd just be we'd just be rewriting standards tracker, you know. So it's kind of like you don't reinvent the wheel, kind of thing. Cool. Would you guys agree if you, if we say you really need to know what's going on behind the scenes that you can do uh, and 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 you know, not operate the security tools, but check if this is really a threat. Or a false positive. So I, I, I found out. I need you need to learn a lot about web architecture. Are you on the front end? Are you in the back end? Where does the data come from? What is this cross-site scripting all about? And with these tools, you really can learn this stuff in deep. And you have to. Otherwise, there is no chance. You cannot just learn. Okay, every time I see this, I have to do that. If you don't understand what's What's behind the scenes? You cannot decide what to do. That's, that's this, right? half. I think the other half is you've got to build it into your development process. And like I said, that it doesn't matter which tool gets more if you decide not to use it, or you decide, wow, that had you know 50 vulnerabilities. I'm only going to fix five and move on because I don't think the other 45 are worth it. Right. This, this is the problem, is any tool is just a way to automate stuff. It shouldn't be something that you just blindly trust. And once you get all the vulnerabilities the tool gets, I mean, neither one of these talk about like data access, right? So you might have a perfectly secure app that I could see rows I'm not supposed to see. So that there's a whole other side. And that, that's my caution is, yeah, you, you do need to educate yourself. It's our job, right? That's part of our job as developers to understand at least from the Oracle and the Apex side, where the vulnerability points exist, how to mitigate them, and then you use the tool to help you find probably the easy, quick ones, but the, the harder ones, the tools are gonna help you find. You're gonna have to know what to do to, to mitigate a lot of those. Cool, and speaking and of- I can just add what, what, Scott, what Scott said, though, I know we're out of time here, but there was a gentleman from uh, Global Information Security. He wanted us to install um, uh, E-Cert or Apex Cert on our big internal corporate instance, if for no other reason than to get people thinking about security from day one, rather than have it be this, um, you know, afterthought, right? And, and so you're exactly right. It's people need to be conscious of this immediately. And doing any web development, whether Apex or or any framework. Yeah. Are there any trainings in the pipeline, guys? Because I really find it helpful to have a, um, a training about security every now and then, even if you do it for many years. We're, we're going to try to get back into the public training in 2018, but we do on-site, you know, client-specific training all the time. Uh, yeah, likewise. I mean, most of our most of our time is spent doing kind of paid work, so the training does tend to get shoveled down the priority list a little bit, um, and we can only but apologize for that. We've got two more questions. Dan, I don't know if you wanted to hit those up real quick before we wrap up. No, we're five minutes over. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, I think in summary, developers need to learn uh, the vulnerabilities and how to fix them. But you're going to make mistakes. We're all human. And so you got to use tools to review and check your work for you and take a layered approach to security and use as many of these tools as you can, all three of them, quite frankly. So. Okay, guys. Thank you all very much. Then, thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Five dog you. So, it will it, will it, in. Uh, no, one last question. Joel, one last question. Will we get 5.2 or will we get Apex 18? Uh, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's an answer. <laughs> Hi thank guys. you all for being Bye. here today, thank, and thank you to all the attendees as well. Have a good day. Bye, everybody.